This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. This is Stacey Clardy, and today I'm speaking with Nico Dosenbach. Nico is an Associate Professor of Pediatric Neurology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Nico's been on the podcast before, you'll recall. He spoke to us in April 2020 about neural networks relating to deep brain stimulation. But this time, Nico, you're shaking up the very foundation here of how we learn about topographic brain organization. And you've come after the homunculus, which I really like the homunculus. This was how I learned my brain anatomy. We were all taught about this in our foundational neuroscience courses. And we're going to talk about the paper you and your group published in Nature in April 2023. The title of that paper is A Somatocognitive Action Network Alternates with Effector Regions in Motor Cortex. Because I guess nature doesn't let you have catchy titles. But really, I think you should have titled it Redrawing the Entire Homunculus. So, (laughs) Nico, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So your work and this paper in particular really does directly impact how we learn about and teach functional neuroanatomy to all clinicians. So I think our listeners will remember that disproportionate illustration of the homunculus. We all learn this in our foundational courses as the upside down representation of the human body moving from toe to head, draped over the cerebral cortex, and it's meant to model how the brain controls movement, right? It had huge hands and huge lips and relatively smaller areas of the rest of the body. And I think it's stuck in all of our heads. It was such a powerful representation. It's certainly one of the only questions I could always reliably get correct on neuroanatomy tests. So in reading your paper, I realized I'm not even familiar with how the concept of this homunculus came to be. So before we get into your work and why you found that it's not entirely accurate, can you give us a little history on the origins of the homunculus? Absolutely. Penfield, the neurosurgeon, Canadian-American neurosurgeon, Mother Penfield, I think he can be credited with coming up with both the concept and the name and the famous drawing that everybody's seen. And it was other folks that worked on this topic before him, but he did the most work on it. It was all direct electrocortical stimulation in neurosurgical patients, mostly for epilepsy and tumors. But he wrote a book about it, published a lot. And I think the story was that at some point he asked the nurse that was working with him to make him a drawing. And that's the famous original homunculus drawing that's in his book. It was based on his stimulation data, but in his book, he does say that this is this, the homunculus and this drawing are mainly an aid to teach medical students neuroanatomy and shouldn't be taken too literally. But I think that got sort of lost and it's a great story and a great model and it got overinterpreted and taken too seriously. And how long ago was that about? The famous drawing is from a book in 1948, but the, the data and the concept are from earlier. So with that background in mind, how did you become involved in studying the homunculus? The honest answer is by chance. We were not trying to study that. We were actually trying to use it as a control because I felt like it was the most secure functional neuroanatomy in the cortex that I knew about, had the best support. And so, you know, we use a method called the arresting state functional connectivity a lot. And we had new data and we were trying out new methods. And so I was asking folks, first look at new data that's processed in a new way. Can you show me something that I know what it's supposed to look like and that we would always go look at the connectivity in primary motor cortex. And the original classical functional connectivity finding from 1995 is that the left and right hand representation in primary motor cortex are strongly functionally connected to each other and then to the SMA supplementary motor area on the midline. And so that's what I was looking for to make sure that the data weren't processed the wrong way. There wasn't just some glaring error And what happened is we could find that motif, but if we sort of went up above the hand spot or just below it, there was a totally different motif that made absolutely no sense. That was completely different, which is essentially that the regions in between the foot, hand, and mouth representations were connected to each other within the same hemisphere, which the foot, hand, and mouth representations are absolutely not connected to each other. And also to a bunch of other regions that I knew from my prior work were involved in executive control, action control. And 
you know, I've been seeing this for a while, actually, before I even let it enter my mind that maybe the homunculus isn't quite right. In the beginning, it was just like, oh, well, I don't know what to make of this. It doesn't compute. But eventually I realized that maybe this weird finding, it kept cropping up over and over again, was actually the, like real and interesting. And so then eventually I decided we had to chase this down instead of just ignoring it and made it a project and got the hypothesis that this could be a set of regions that are involved in more higher order action related processing, sort of secondary for maybe two years. It was just this weird thing that nobody could make any sense of. Yeah, sure. That's wild. I mean, right. Basically, your control group, if you will, in your experiments was not really the control that you wanted it to be, right? That can derail you a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. I was looking for security and, you know, same old and I know what this is supposed to look like and found the opposite. It was definitely a jarring. Yeah. And I read also the editorial you wrote for, for Scientific American about the nature paper. You actually said, and I chuckled, that the imaging pattern bothered you so much it was popping in your dreams. You know, I really love brain mapping. I even just really like maps. And so together with Evan Gordon, the first author, he's a professor at WashU in radiology. I would say we got a little obsessed with it and would sort of stay up late thinking about it and messaging each other ideas with other experiments to do. I did feel it was a big sort of heretical undertaking to try to revise what I, the very first thing I ever learned about the brain. That's fantastic. I was so glad you did it. When it's that fun and that exciting, absolutely. I could see I could be having the, the late night texting back and forth. So you coined the term uh, somatocognitive action network or, or SCAN, if I'm, if I'm saying it right, the SCAN, somatocognitive action network, to describe the complexities of what you found within what we traditionally thought of as the homunculus and, and how this network basically executes a plan to move the whole body. And when describing this network, you say, and I'll, I'll quote you here, it integrates mind and body by linking to other brain regions, controlling breathing, heart rate, muscle tension, even butterflies in the stomach. So can you break that down for us? Using that example, I like the one you said, butterflies in the stomach. I think that's a sensation we've all experienced. Can you explain to me how the somatocognitive action network functions for me to have that sensation of butterflies in my stomach? Your brain is for behavior. It's, it's not so you can have fun or, you know, a rich inner life. It's so that you can act, right? And that's different from movement. Just movement, you know, if you're just swinging your arms, you're just wasting calories, right? You have a brain to move with purpose. So how does the purpose get into your movements? And this single protein network, which is this high order executive control network there in the prefrontal cortex, the regions classically associated with things like abstract planning, decision making, initiating voluntary actions. And those regions are very strongly connected directly into these somatocognitive action network regions that are actually in the central sulcus in classical M1. So the idea is that a voluntary action plan gets cooked up in prefrontal cortex. And there's still a lot of magic here in the sense that we don't know exactly how these things work. But these nodes that are in classical or previously classical motor cortex actuators, like you need them to convert the abstract plans into actual actions. So for example, if you get up quickly, right, you don't pass out because you knew you're going to get up and you can regulate your blood pressure in anticipation. So this network also includes the physiology you have, like autonomic drive for things like fight and flight. It includes probably the most important action feedback, which is pain. If you're doing something and it hurts, that's really salient. That's really important. You should probably not do that again. So for a while, there'd been all these articles published where it seemed like brain regions were doing disparate things like pain and executive control. I used to think that there's no way that those are both true. And now in retrospect, the one sort of super label, like higher order category that can bring this all under one umbrella would be that you need all these things. And it's like sort of a single top down, fully integrated network that goes from hatching a plan that you might execute in a year to actually the physiological changes and all the movement codes you need to make it happen. And the butterfly in the stomach, right? It's like you can have uh, a sympathetic nervous system response by just thinking about something in the future that could be scary or stressful. Like in my case, it used to be, I could think about a presentation I have to give a scary one, maybe to a room full of neurologists. Right. And I would feel my own stress response, but my heart would go up. I'd feel that feeling in my stomach, just probably losing some blood supply to your stomach. And it's a fight or flight kind of response. But all I'm doing is sitting in my chair, thinking about something that's a month from now. 
So the idea would be that really these things are so linked, like your abstract plans and your physiological response to them or, or the physiological aspects of your plans, they're in the same network. So we can't really cleanly separate them. This is why you can give yourself anxiety by just thinking about things. To be a little, That's a little too colloquial, maybe. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. So is it fair... I find myself holding on to the homunculus or irrationally here, almost like I need a t-shirt for it, like like they have for Pluto when <laughs> it got downgraded, you know? So is it fair to maybe say that, that this network is superimposed on top of or throughout the homunculus based on the way you describe it? I mean, known cortex, there's usually multiple organizational principles that can overlap over the same piece of tissue, right? I think to some degree that's possible, I do think, and this is kind of interesting, that functional connectivity data in the resting state are probably the strongest. I do think, like in retrospect, the evidence for the homunculus was never that strong. Angela Sirigo wrote a great review on that point a few years ago. I think it was maybe always just your fine motor specialist type of things, like fine motor of the mouth and voice apparatus for speech, and then your fingers and your toes. Because it seems like Neurologists, we use the term gross motor, which I actually as a you know, student and resident, I always thought gross motor, fine motor, it sounded silly. Um, and now I'm like, actually, maybe not. That it's really organized into whole, like there's sort of gross motor control over everything. And then you have these specialist systems that allow you to do certain isolated fine finger movements and speech and stuff like that. So I think, I think there may have never been a homunculus. Oh, wow. You, re- you really just went for it there. For motor anyway. I'm not talking about somatic sensory. (laughs) Fair enough. How do you explain this? Let's say you're at the bedside and a patient's had a stroke overlaying the area we would would traditionally think of as the homunculus. And and the medical student's very excited because they got out the picture of the homunculus. And and in fact, it, it falls right over, I don't know, the foot or something. How do you explain this concept to the patient at the bedside? That's wow. That's a tough one. I have not tried that. <laughs> Now's your opportunity. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing we also have in the article is that it looks like the foot, hand, mouth are organized, sort of center surround, going from more distal to more proximal, in these concentric rings, like an organization we know from other parts of cortex, like in the sensory systems. And the foot, hand, mouth affect the specific regions that are the ones about well, the foot and the hand mainly, the ones that are strongly lateralized. I'm an optimist. I'm from Pete. I always look on the bright side and I I, I try saying you have this generalist system and that's more bilateral. So I'd be hopeful that you get the movement back of your shoulder and elbow and maybe, maybe wrist, but I'd be worried about the fingers, for example. Right. And that leads me into my next question, which is how can we use your work to inform intervention and treatment and maybe, I don't know, functional neurosurgery? What's the next step? Yeah, we've been trying to triage, and there's been a lot of excitement, I would say, maybe. The biggest one has been uh, chronic pain, including chronic post-stroke pain. There's evidence that uh, neuromodulation either with TMS or with electrodes over motor cortex seemed to help, which I have to admit that when I heard that, I was like, that makes no sense, that that has to be placebo. I don't, I don't believe it, right? And when we got these data... We weren't the only ones. I mean, pretty much everybody who, who saw this went, maybe this is why the motor cortex stimulation works for pain, because it's actually there's these nodes in there that aren't really motor cortex. that are somatocognitive action network regions, which includes processing either forward or bottom up or top down of pain signals. So there's been a lot of excitement there. I think functional neurosurgeons and, and movement disorders, neurologists have also been interested in the nodes in, that are in this network in the deep gray. So the VIM and the central median nucleus, which are, you know, DBS targets. What I like the most about this finding is that it's a bunch of treatments that I used to be skeptical of because they didn't make sense. They now make more sense. Another one would be DBS of the central median nucleus for epilepsy. Another function that's in this network, I think, is arousal. Like the first thing that happens if you're going to do something is you kind of wake up, right? You, you have to. You go to a higher state of alertness. So I think this system includes ways of whole brain activation, almost like a network stimulant. And in that sense, it wouldn't be totally crazy that if you stimulate a node in there, you can maybe tampen down cortex and you could raise the seizure threshold. I used to think that made no sense to do DBS for generalized epilepsy. And now I'm like, oh, this this makes some sense. So DBS, central median nucleus and the VIM, there's some interest there. A lot of psychiatric things potentially 
OCD and ADHD sort of in opposite directions, right? You, you're stuck on an action plan that's not really good for you, or you can't stick to the one that you're supposed to be doing to keep switching all the time. That'd be ADHD, the bottom up aspects of anxiety, you know, the, this notion that you can make yourself anxious by reading out your body signals. You're right. When, when you think about it more deeply, there's a lot of layers to it, as you're pointing out, and, and perhaps argues more for using the functional MRI to develop creative targets, right? Like in the OR, when doing a DBS, instead of going after the traditional targets, do you use this data to maybe inform a slightly more creative target and see what response you get before permanent lead placement, right? We're trying to pursue that. There's so many avenues and so much to be done. I think partially trying to figure out which ones we want to go after. And so, of course, we want to pursue this, use this approach to personalize neuromodulation and neurosurgical interventions and things like TMS also. That's definitely a goal. Who knows if it'll pan out, but we're going to try. No, it's great. I really appreciate you blowing up your experiment and, and digging into the control there. <laughs> no, it's so powerful that you're peeling back the layers of the onion. And I'm not going to lie, I'm going to miss the plain old uh, funny looking version of the homunculus. <laughs> but this is such a fantastic development uh, in the understanding that perhaps already is benefiting patients, but certainly is hopeful for even more ground up rational approach to treatments for patients as well. So thank you for explaining it to us today. I, I've really learned a lot. Oh, thank you. Again, the Nature paper is titled A Somatocognitive Action Network Alternates with Effector Regions in Motor Cortex. Or for the cliff notes, you can also check out the editorial in the April Scientific American issue under the title How Our Team Overturned the 90-Year-Old Metaphor of a Little Man in the Brain Who Controls Movement. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.